All right, let's get right into this one. I'm gonna build up momentum as I go. All right, so the point of this particular discussion is talking about quadras and how they relate to society, societies in the past. It's giving a sort of an abstract, very broad, generalized view of how these societies operate based upon quadra value. In this particular case, we're focusing mostly on beta and gamma, because they're kind of the central quadras that have perhaps, I don't want to say more relevance, but uh, they typically are the more dominant societies that we tend to see throughout history. It's just a lot easier to point to. Um, it's an idea that comes a bit from Galingo, at least the first person I recall really discussing it. And this is one of those moments where I do agree with Galinko on this. This being the concept that you have the four quadrants and that alpha and delta are more the periphery, typically just sort of falling in on betas and gamma. Okay. Having said that, there are instances where you can find alpha quadra, very pure like alpha quadra civilizations. When you look at hunter-gatherer sort of civilizations that are largely untouched by civilization in remote parts of the world, out in Papua New Guinea and other places like that, we can point to that. We can point to Delta-like civilizations. There's a lot of them now. Many people would describe a lot of parts of Europe to this day to be kind of the retiree, sleepy Delta-like vibe. In fact, I would say that Italy is an excellent example of this. Uh, in fact, I would say that you could probably just talk about Italy and go through all four quadrants in timeline sequence and describe all the quadrants perfectly, just focusing on Italy's history alone. But I'll save that for another time. Now that I think about it, I mean, that sounds like kind of, but again, let's go to beta and gamma quadrants and how they look different, how they would arrange themselves. And in this case, how they'd even face off against each other. So part of the inspiration for all of this comes from uh, Peter Bartle and Jack Aaron and the other members of the World Sociotic Society. Many years ago, they talked about various societies like this. And uh, in particular, they brought up examples of Rome and they brought up examples of the Middle Ages, Italy, where you see Florence and Venice and a lot of these other city states that were very mercantile in their approach. Um, and they use these as examples of beta uh, versus gamma and so on. Nice interview. Uh, well, it wasn't an interview. It was a presentation. It was, in my opinion, fun, fantastic. I wish I was there. So this is kind of my contribution to uh, wishing that I was there. Uh, I think a better example, it's just more to the point than what Peter Bartle was describing was to just stick within the same era, let's call it, this classical period, and stick with just showing the differences between Rome and Carthage and the wars, the Punic Wars between the two of them as a great example of beta versus uh, gamma. So let's do that. So Rome versus Carthage. Now, most people have heard of Rome and have some idea of what Rome is about, even if it's a very vague one, but we'll talk about some of that. The image you're looking at on the screen is a painting of what Carthage would have looked like or how it was described. Carthage being another Mediterranean superpower based out of Tunisia or what is modern day Tunisia. They were a maritime power for the most part based around trade around through the ocean, through the Mediterranean, sail and trade. They were a naval power, and this has been their tradition. As you can see in the image here, they had a wonderful port that was known to have this kind of circular design, allowing ships to come in, dock in various places, come back out, and so on. It's a signature piece of the city. All right, so 
focus on Carthage for a minute, just because I feel most people would be less aware of Carthage. So Carthage, here, yeah, well, uh, show you on the map the areas that we're looking at. Mm, give me a okay, let's just go with that. So if you can see on this here. So we have Italy up here. You see Rome on the map. And then over here, Africa, right here, city of Carthage. So where did Carthage come from? Carthage was descended from Phoenicians, Phoenician traders. The Phoenicians were people who likely came from the east and were known as traders. They were known as merchants that traveled by sea, shipping goods of all sorts all throughout the Mediterranean to different places. They were known as being language builders, the old Rosetta Stone, and so forth. They created a language that serves as sort of the bedrock of a lot of modern day Western alphabet-like based language. These traders eventually setting up different ports and cities all throughout the Mediterranean where they could trade, they could establish different colonies and so on established a colony here and it was called Carthage. This particular colony became so wealthy, so powerful, so strong that over time it eventually came to dominate the Mediterranean and the entire naval trade lanes that was going on at the time. It became the dominant superpower city. So Carthage now becomes the new capital city. Now how is Carthage governed? Right now we're talking Gamma Quadrant stuff. Carthage was predominantly governed by an oligarchy. Okay. A number of wealthy citizens would form its Senate, overall governing body. And the only major requirement to be part of that Senate was that you had a lot of money. You had to reach a certain level of money and business influence. And if you did that, then you were in. You're part of the overall Senate. You had a voice. There was very limited leadership in terms of any single person being in charge. They did not like that. So everything was done in kind of a democratic, everyone sort of votes as part of the Senate. Everyone gets a chance to speak their piece and then people sort of vote on it and make moves. Now you notice already things that I've mentioned, key themes popping out. Everything being based around naval trade and shipping and mercantile selling of things. Trade is everything. Money, making money is what everyone's really after. And money, financial power, is really what made you elevated in status enough to now have a position within the Senate, to now have a true voice. Carthage, militarily, while it did have its own standing army, it was generally very small, and they relied heavily on mercenaries. Okay. Mercenaries, as we know, soldiers that you pay, hire them in order to fight for you. But once you stop paying them, they're gone, right? So it's all about money. Back to that usage of, of just money and exchange of services and so on and so on. Everyone is operating very much like a independent contractor, a uh, free agent here. You pay me and we make a deal we mer that I'll work for you in some way, either as a in a business kind of relationship or in a mercenary relationship, which you could argue really business transaction too, right? So everything very, very much wrapping around business and around each individual's personal interest in some way. This is back to Gamma, very financially focused, very independent minded, extremely independent. Everyone is kind of their own person out for their own interests, kind of achieving their own ends, um, looking at things in a very pragmatic business, deals kind of way. We make a deal and we work together as long as that deal works for you, for both of us. And if not, we go our separate ways. It's very much that kind of attitude in general. It's the abstract in general view that we're talking about here. So that was basically Carthaginian society. Now at some point, what do we have that ends up happening? Carthage being in control of the entire Mediterranean 
from a naval point of view, shipping to all these different islands, all these different places. They come in contact and eventually war with Rome, the other emerging Mediterranean superpower, Rome based out of Italy. Right? And they're going to initially have their first major war and clash over the island of Syracuse, over Sicily down, Syracuse, one of the towns. And they're going to be fighting predominantly over this particular island, but they're going to be fighting all across the ocean area, on land in Sicily, and a few other places. Okay. So let's talk Rome. What's Rome about? How's Rome different? Rome, Rome's history is quite, well, it's just different. So in the mythology of Rome, Rome liked to think that it was descended from those who fled from Troy. They fled from the destruction of Troy and some come to Italy and eventually form their own city. Along the way, they're very militarized. There are a group of people that very much adopt this attitude. We need to aggressively attack those around us and take what we can, defend what we've got, and then create our city even going as so far as raiding other neighboring civilizations around them and stealing not only their valuables, but also even their women. Because early on, a lot of Romans were predominantly men. Men of ill repute, men who were, some were pirates, some were galleywags along the way, some were former soldiers, some were whatever. Right? And this is kind of the basis of how they sort of became Rome. Eventually, Rome comes together and it has its king. And they go on to, again, aggressively defend themselves and build up their particular city, right? As time passes, they move away from a king. They don't want tyrannical kings anymore. They see the problem of having a tyrannical king. So they start to come up with their own senate, if you will, start to build a republic. But they understand, first off, that in times of crisis, in times of need, you need a single leader. So contrary to what Carthage does, Rome sets up a system of consuls. They create this particular title called the consul. Now, the consul is an individual who is elected to serve a one-year term as dictator. And when they are dictators, they are literally dictators. Their rules, their declarations are law. They have total power. Now, their term was only meant to be a year, and then they would have to try to be reelected again, or somebody else could come in. This was Rome's trying to bridge the gap, trying to find a middle ground of having somebody who would be in charge and have the necessary authority to mobilize the city to mobilize the people, to mobilize the army in order to achieve goals. But at the same time, avoid having a dictator, somebody who would be in charge for life and do whatever they wanted. So this was Rome's kind of approach. Now, again, we mentioned earlier that Rome was really founded more on military conquest. It's always been in Rome's DNA to wage war on others and to view things from a lens of total war. To Rome, going to war was not something where you just fight a little bit and then you have a peace deal and then it's over, we make some arrangements and move on. No. To Rome, they typically look at conflicts with others as a total thing. We are Roman. You are something else. You have now declared war on us, so we are in conflict, and it is now our mindset as Romans to annihilate you, to so destroy you that either you will have no power to ever rise again to fight us, or we literally wipe you off the face of the earth so there's not one man, woman, or child left alive. You will never risk challenging us again. That was the Roman mentality and the Roman style of warfare that was rather unique to the classical period. Most civilizations of this time 
saw war as kind of that there were certain rules you fought and then you made trades, you made concessions, you made a certain negotiation and then everybody, and everybody goes kind of their own way. It didn't need to be a total war, either we die or you die kind of mentality, but Rome saw it that way. So this gets into beta quadrant values of Rome, first off being very militarized at all times throughout its, throughout its culture. Really, it is until the very end, towards the last century or so, as you get to the fall of Rome, that Rome kind of loses that hard military end. It was always embedded with them. Rome always maintained this mentality of us versus them. You are part of us. Great. Stay loyal to what we do. And if you're not part of us, we will sub subjugate you or destroy you. Very beta-like. Rome was also very interested in leadership. We talked about initially the kings, eventually they create a republic, but they realized the importance of having a centralized leader, a single person that would command everything, dictate it all. They knew the necessity of that and respected the necessity. Right? Very beta quadra to have this leadership like mentality. Now, Rome also would go on about having um, a very competitive-like nature in its political system. Rome really enjoyed, saw it as a benefit, let's call it, that a lot of their political leaders would clash with each other, would squabble, would fight with each other in order to gain uh, more glory for themselves, more prestige, and so on, and eventually rise to the top. This was, in Rome's eyes, a good thing. This competitive spirit of may the best, may the best man win, may the best man rise to the top in the political spectrum and become a high senator or a high, uh, you know, become a consul or whatever. This was very much ingrained with the with also the military. Rome viewed politicians as being unworthy if you didn't have military glory. So if you had any kind of ambition, you had to serve in the Roman army at some point and distinguish yourself. You couldn't just serve and be in the background. You really needed to try to stand out and try to do something or be a part of some campaigns to gain some glory. By doing so, you sort of demonstrate your commitment to the state, your commitment to the military, to the military tradition, your willingness to use force, and just gain glory that you can now show off and tell everybody and all this other stuff. It was very common for Romans who did have glory that change their name, to officially have their name altered in some way that now adds literally into their name, their military conquest. Um, so in later parts of this war, the Punic Wars, there's three of them, by the way, you will have a guy who rises to the top at the end who was known as Scipio who ends up finally winning. Scipio, his name changes and eventually becomes Scipio Africana. That literally becomes his name. Why? Because he was being credited for his campaigns and conquest of Africa. Spoiler alert, right? He's credited for that. And now his name is changed to reflect his glory. Scipio Africana. Imagine you had a fighter today you had a boxer or somebody, you, let's say you had Mike Tyson, you had Canelo Alvarez, you had some of these guys, and their name isn't Canelo Alvarez anymore. Their name is now, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, how, the, you know, all the names of all the different fighters he's beaten, like so many of them at this point, right? But you just start putting in there, you know, like, Canelo plants, Canelo destroyer of plants, because uh, all these different fighters that he's beaten, right? And that just becomes their official name. Just a way of demonstrating your glory and affecting people based on your glory, right? So again, back to beta quasi. All this stuff, very SE, a lot of use of military force, a lot of use of competition, politicians competing with each other, people fighting with each other, uh, may the best man win kind of attitude. Uh, very SE stuff constantly, but a lot of FE stuff, right? A lot of glory seeking. 
I need glories. I need my name. I need to demonstrate these campaigns. I need to demonstrate my commitment to the city itself, to Rome itself and Roman army and, and all this other stuff, right? A lot of FE going on, a lot of SE going on, all this kind of stuff happening. A lot of beta quadrants out Religion. Rome did have its own uh, religious ceremonies, different approaches. Much of it co-opted from Greek that many of us know about. Instead of it being Ares, the god of war, you now have Mars. Um, instead of it being Zeus, you now have Jupiter. Right? And all the planets of the solar system are essentially named or, well, how do I want to say this? The Roman gods essentially are named for the planets or the planets named for Roman gods. If you want to call it. Like I said, Mars is now Aries, Jupiter is now Zeus, Neptune is now Poseidon, you know, et cetera, right? It was a very religious kind of um, kind of culture that had a lot of varying ceremonies that it would be obligated to do that they believed in. Whereas the Greeks viewed Ares, the god of war, as unnecessary evil, but he was not looked favorably upon by most of the Greek city states, with the exception of Sparta. Sparta was the only city state that really worshipped. Ares, the god of war, and for obvious reasons. When you get to, well, they looked upon Ares again as a necessary evil, as kind of a horror, as what happens when male aggressiveness and war gets out of hand and just runs wild and in a very chaotic, stupid, aggressive kind of way, running around ravaging cities and so on with warfare. Athena was looked upon as being much higher and better because Athena was seen as a god of strategy, a god of wisdom, and defense rather than offense, what Ares is seen as. So Athena was more widely looked at as a good thing. Hence, you get Athens for Athena. Rome, again, being super beta militarized, said, uh -uh, we're kind of rewriting some of the mythology. And to us, Ares, who we now call Mars, is actually our true favorite god that we love very much. And we, we invoke his name constantly for battle. And, like that. Uh, and it is that masculine, aggressive, offensive mindset that we really value and really enjoy. Very much interested. So there's a lot of religious components that kind of come into this, this difference in mythology and the gods that they're worshiping and why. Again, very aggressive, very beta. Okay. There's other stuff I can go into as far as religion with Carthage, but it doesn't matter. Let's move on. I think the point's been made. So when the wars eventually break out between Carthage and Rome, you see a very mercenary, heavy armies in Carthage using a lot of naval forces in particular, which navies are expensive as well to build ships, going after the Romans and fighting with Romans on Sicily during the first Punic Wars. Eventually, you get to the second Punic Wars and you're seeing fighting out here now in Spain. You see these territories in Carthage, fighting in Gaul, fighting all the way into Rome, etc. Right. And then we get to the Third Punic War and a lot of fighting is just here. So, right. Just a broad overview of the different wars happening. But with Carthage, you're seeing, again, high usage of mercenaries. You're seeing a lot of difficulty in figuring out how they want to solve this war because they were really looking to win a battle and then do for peace, do for terms find some kind of an arrangement that would work. But the Romans kept refusing that because in Rome mentality, they were like, no, you decided to go to war with us. It's to the death. Either you destroy us and you destroy Rome or we destroy you. But we're not doing this sue for peace kind of thing. We refuse to sue for peace until we have the upper hand completely. Now, after the first 
or, or by the end of the first war, Romans actually lose enormous numbers of armies at sea. Many times did 60,000 some odd Roman soldiers, entire armies, get lost at sea because Romans were not very good as sailors, at first anyway. They were a land army particularly. And so they didn't really understand how to sail very well. They didn't know how to build boats very well. They didn't understand how to navigate sea storms and issues like that well. So there are many instances of sea storms occurring that completely destroy entire armies, men lost at sea, drowning, and so on, as many as 50 to 60,000. And you would think, well, maybe Rome will stop now after they've lost several armies. This happens, I think, as many as three times that entire armies are lost at sea. But again, that Roman mentality of we will not quit, we will fight to the end, S-E all the way, forget S-I, we don't care. Rome would carry on. They would just build a new army and they would get plenty of volunteers and they would get plenty of people and they would recruit and order other people. They would build these armies very, very quickly and retrain them and reorganize them. Roman armies are known for their, their discipline as well. I think that's very well known. How uh, extreme discipline, extreme adherence to the leadership of the army very hierarchical. Whoever commands the army and so on has total control. Very hierarchical as well. Something you don't see gammas liking. So let's get back to it anyway. I'm deviating slightly. So you have these Roman armies, lots of discipline, the motivation to keep joining up no matter the loss, keep fighting until we've won. They keep coming. Now you have um the major battles that eventually occur even outside of Carthage, where Carthage finally wins a land battle in decisive fashion. And they won it because they were able to finally contract a mercenary. What's his name? I can't even pronounce it. The Spartan commander that they hired, who finally kind of rearranged their army, reorganized it, made a new plan for battle. Basically, the Carthaginians were just kind of shitty in the way they were organizing the battle strategy. What's his name? Xanthippus? Let's go with that. I'm hopefully I'm pronouncing that correct. Xanthippus. I challenge you all to try to pronounce it. Was a Spartan commander that they hired as a mercenary, as I said, and he leads them to a victory after the end of the first Punic War. Now, what's important about this particular guy, as it relates to Gamma Quadra, is that Xanthippus, after winning this major battle, which eventually ends the First Punic War, he becomes very popular in Carthage, as one tends to do when they win a huge decisive victory. Many of the Carthaginian senators really saw him as a political threat, as somebody who could potentially become so popular that he gains too much authority, too much um, leadership, whatever, within Carthage. So there was talk of perhaps assassinating him or politically muscling him out, etc. all of this stuff. And Xanthippus, seeing the negativity, seeing what's kind of uh, around the corner here, he finally just leaves. They stop paying him, he leaves, and he disappears from history as far as we know. Presumably, maybe he goes back home to Sparta or Greece or whatever. There's a certain silly jealousy that kind of comes on here that maybe is very Gamma Quadra, or maybe not jealousy, but more like considering this one individual to be a bit of a threat to your authority and power. And so they sort of, you know, show him the door. Unlike Rome, they don't want one centralized leader. They absolutely refuse to have that and push anybody who might do that away. So Carthage gets rid of their best commander, the one guy that finally showed real knack as a, as a military leader. They got rid of him. Crazy. 
but they did so because they don't want their autonomy threatened and they don't want any kind of leader to take over. Very gamma. Now, during the Second Punic War, and this is the most famous part of it all. Oh, no. Uh, headphones for you, huh? Okay, hopefully it's still going. I'm going to keep rolling. Carry on. All right, so during the Second Punic War, you now have the great Hannibal Barca, right? Hannibal, who leads so many battles and wins, fighting predominantly with also a large mercenary component. He eventually threatens the city of Rome itself. But that becomes a problem, too. He eventually starts pleading for reinforcements, more soldiers, more money, more funds to help him in Rome. But a lot of people who started to get nervous in Carthage that Hannibal was becoming too popular, too successful, and that he and his family would start to take over in Carthage. So many of his competitors in the Carthaginian Senate refused him any help, making the argument that, well, since he's winning battles and doing so well in Italy, it sounds to me like he doesn't actually need any reinforcements or help, so we're not going to send him anything really kind of leaning, leaving Hannibal out to dry. Once again, the desire to stay away from any kind of hierarchical leadership of letting anyone really take over gets the better of Carthage. This need for autonomy, this need for independence, this need where all the senators and all the leadership never have to bow down to any particular person just gets the better of their judgment. Eventually, Carthage loses yet again during the Second Punic War. Eventually, they finally end up losing in the Third Punic Wars. And at this point, Rome finally said, you know what, we're done fighting with you guys. We really hate you guys. So they famously siege the city of Carthage. This is where Scipio comes in. Scipio Africanus, he leads the Roman army that besieges the city of Carthage, and eventually they break into Carthage, destroy the entire city, and famously lay salt all over the grounds of Carthage with the idea that they hope nothing will ever grow here again. Carthage will never rise. Total destruction of Carthage thus ending this long war and this long rivalry, really, between Rome and Carthage. And Rome now cements itself as the true undisputed superpower of the Mediterranean. And the sky's the limit pretty much after this. I would argue that once Rome defeated Carthage, not long after that, they kind of started dealing with the Greeks. But once they defeated Carthage, they were pretty much unstoppable. There was there was no major organized power anywhere near them that could challenge their control of the Mediterranean or really stop them from taking control of Western Europe completely. Notice if you look at the map here, Carthage controlled most of Africa and most of Spain. Once Carthage falls, Italy basically, or Rome, excuse me, Rome takes over Carthage territory. So now it controls Italy, it controlled Sicily, it controlled Corsica, Sardinia, all these different islands, controlled the Balearic Islands. It controlled that whole part of Northern Africa, even into Libya that we see there, and controlled Spain and parts of Gaul, which is part of modern day France. Right. All that really falls within their control. It becomes such a huge territory. It's like, what? I mean, who's left to stop these guys? All right. So, again, hopefully the audio is holding up here. 
So let's wrap it up. Uh, so in summary, you are seeing a very gamma-like society in Carthage, very much focused on trade, on individual accomplishments, on autonomy, everyone having their own achievements, their own power based on their successes, based on their, their financial successes mostly. Um, although not always financial, I like to stress this, gammas are not always about money not true what they are about is autonomy independence freedom from anyone holding any kind of authority or power over them that sometimes comes in the form of having a lot of money because money is a great way to maintain your freedom but it's not the only way you can be somebody who works in some kind of industry or career path where you have a lot of uh, autonomy you are a you are what was the word i'm looking for you are um self-employed you have your own small business whatever you could argue that many of the mercenaries that were fighting for them could be very gamma in that sense right this is very different from rome right you take mercenaries mercenaries are fighting for you for money and for a lot of money they want a lot of profit for their service. And why would I pay a bad soldier a lot of money? No. Many of these soldiers, like Xanthippus, whatever his name is, and many other mercenaries are actually quite good. Carthage was known for a lot of Numidian cavalry that you see Numidia on the map. Some of the greatest light cavalry in the ancient world. They hired out a lot of these guys. These guys were good. Xanthippus was good. A lot of these people were very talented. They had a lot of skill. They had a lot of prestige. And they had their own autonomy as mercenaries. They're making a deal with you saying, okay, I will use my skills that I have achieved. Gamma is very achievement-oriented, individual achievement. I have achieved these skills as a warrior and so on, and I will fight for you for a cost, for a price, you're gonna pay me something substantial. And that's the deal. Once that deal no longer serves me anymore or serves you, then I'm, I'm out, I'm gone. Super different from Rome. Rome was about loyalty to Rome, loyalty to your leadership, loyalty to the hierarchy, loyalty to the gods, etc. You were meant to sacrifice yourself if needed for Rome, for the leadership. It was about making yourself subservient to the gods, to the consul, to your military officers, and overall to Rome itself. It was about loyalty to the group, to the city-state. Service to the city, through military action, through military deeds, uh, glory-seeking constantly, for everyone, really, within Rome. Climbing that social, political hierarchy through glory, through your demonstration of your loyalty to the city, to the group, through your, your glories in battle or glories in action or whatever. It's not about money, and it's not about your own autonomy at all. Very, very beta. Very much about winning at all costs. Either you die or you win. That's really what it came down to. It made Rome very special in the ancient world. That total war-like mentality, which Carthage didn't have. Carthage was more than fine to win a few battles and then sue for peace or create some kind of deal negotiation that benefits Carthage, that gives them financial leverage or better trade options or whatever, supports them economically in some way. They did not need to win everything to destroy the other side completely. It's just not the thinking process. And that's pretty very gamma-like usually. How could I not bring up Hannah? About to keep going. In true gamma fashion, Hannibal being one of the famous uh, families in Carthage, a military family, again, not money, but very military or uh, oriented. Hannibal's father was a general who served in the first Punic Wars and was actually pretty successful. One of the few generals that was successful. He 
famously or in, in myth almost, he has his young son Hannibal swear an oath to the gods and to him that he would never be a friend to Rome. That he would always be an enemy of Rome. Right? This is the famous myth that we hear about. And Hannibal swears upon that. And sure enough, he proceeds to grow up and become a great general that is one of the most terrifying figures in Roman history with the amount of victories he had. Hannibal's claim to fame, his great autonomy, his independence, his success, his achievements is through military campaign. And only secondary is territory that he takes, land and wealth, and whatever he sees. But it's his military prowess that he and his family obtain the Hannibal clan, Barca family. Um, you can see the gamma in Hannibal. Hannibal being kind of like a representative of Carthage as a city, as a people, and reflective of its culture, this very gamma-like approach. Somebody who was very achievement-oriented, very out there to do things for his family and his clan, um, very ambitious and loyal to various people, loyal to his family members, loyal to a lot of others. Uh, his soldiers loved him. He was very good with his soldiers and so on. But he had a very vengeful-like nature, starting with he will never be a friend to Rome. He will never bow down to Rome ever. Even when he loses the Second Punic War, Hannibal famously leaves the Mediterranean area. He goes away, does not return to Carthage. He, he flees and heads east and keeps going east where he then tries to sell his mercenary services to eastern powers that were enemies of Rome. Eventually, unfortunately, he's caught up by the Romans uh, and he's forced to commit suicide. But by then he was an older man he's in like his 60s, which for that time is pretty old. But it shows somebody who can really hold a grudge. Really hold a grudge their entire life. Uh, super gamma like values, right? And that's the point I'm really getting at. Um, and I think that, again, with Hannibal, you can really see a lot of these gamma traits embodied in one man. Carthage itself, gamma values, all that, it really embodied in one man who single-handedly represents Carthage in all the Punic Wars. That's why we tend to talk about him a lot. Okay, and again, I already went on about Rome. So overall, again, this may be for some people a really nerd out thing, but I think it really talks a lot about beta versus gamma quadra in the kind of an abstract, right? We're talking in general how a society may look where one is very beta, Rome, and one is very gamma, Carthage. And this is kind of how it plays out. Now, does this mean the gamma civilizations are going to lose to betas all the time? No, this is just kind of what happened in this particular context. Right? One could argue that World War II, Nazi Germany is very beta. I mean, it's, it's, it's absurdly beta. And you could argue that many of the Western powers that fought it, like Britain, like the United States in particular, Canada, these are all very gamma-like qualities, very gamma-ish, much more gamma. And we can argue that they were the winners of World War II, right? Somebody in the background, some nerd is going to say, well, what about the Soviets? Yes, the Soviets were extremely beta, and the Soviets also kicked the crap out of Germany and are largely also responsible for the World War I win. But the point is, it's an example where you can see gamma cultures gamma societies winning wars being on the top of the food chain okay as you see nowadays with the united states over the last really the 20th century has been a very has been very good to the united states so that's how you can see it in time traveling um this video is probably long as hell uh thank you for those of you who have through this whole thing, for those of you who are nerdy enough like me to enjoy these kinds of topics, these historical things, 
uh, this kind of discussion and so on. Uh, I would love to you, for those of you who are there still to comment, so on. I'd like to see who are the other people out there in the world that are, are interested in these kinds of topics. Um, I worry that there's very few. Uh, so yeah, I'd like to see some comments, even if it's just like a thanks, thumbs up, whatever. Just kind of lets me know that somebody enjoyed this. Um, and of course, any other thoughts or opinions, whatever other historical context that you'd like to discuss and so on. I think it's only fair to talk about Alpha and Delta on their own at some point um, so that they get their fair share, right? So I'll do that uh, in the future, I'll do that at some point here, get around to it, et cetera. Um, okay, that's good enough. That pretty much concludes this. So on to the next thing.